Kia ora, tulofa, namaste, mai, and welcome to this week's episode of the Niche Cash Variety Show. We're from the niche-cash.com, home of Aotearoa Sporting Yarn, insights, information, and general kōrero. Warm up kōrero here is just taking a taking a moment to marvel at these fabulous Aotearoa sporting times. We've got uh, we are approaching a Black Caps Test series against England. We've got White Ferns preparing for a T Twenty World Cup. We've got the Breakers bandwagon being sparked up all aboard. Stephen Adams isn't playing for the Memphis Grizzlies, which is all good because. The Memphis Grizzlies suck without Stephen Adams, so that's pretty awesome for the value of Stephen Adams. And then the old mate, Sean Marky Marks, he's making wheeling and dealing moves in the NBA as well. So we've got some big things popping for Kiwis in the NBA. The wild card's going to break down the ample number of flying Kiwis transfers that have happened over the past month, which is to say... There's a lot of Kiwi football things popping off around the world with the flying Kiwis, let alone closer to home. We got Kiwis in the A leagues, we got Kiwis in the NBL as as well as the Breakers, and there's also 30, 35 Kiwi NRL juniors playing SG ball on the weekend. Probably going to have the uh, Malmeninga Cup competition starting in Queensland as well which I think is under 18 SG balls under 19 so fabulous Aotearoa sporting times did I miss anything there super smash finals we're going to, there's going to be plenty of super smash in this episode of the variety show that is heating up with elimination finals on Thursday then the big finals this weekend anything else there old mate oh I copious levels of um flying kiwis football stuff going on overseas i'm going to break down the top 10 transfers later on in the mangrove section which just having 10 notable transfers in general seems like a big deal let alone the fact that some of them are actually some of them are, are pretty enticing pretty exciting opportunities as well so i don't know absolute absolute like carnage on the sensors just <laughs> trying to keep up with everything is uh these are the good times, aren't they? Like we get the we get the dull times sometimes, but there's still plenty going on, and you just got to shift your focus to find the fun stuff. But when you get the you get to the points where it's just like everywhere you look, there's more exciting Kiwi sport going on than you can possibly focus on or um, pay attention to all at once. Them's the good times. Not only that, it's all quite like invigorating stuff, like. The Kiwi mm. NRL juniors, it's just a, that's just a learning ground. That's just where I'm learning about who the players are, where they come from, any themes and trends there. Learning about the importance of a player like Stephen Adams. Learning, as we discussed on our Patreon podcast, what's going to happen at the Bay Oval, where that's like a spinning deck. Then you've got the day-night swing and scene factor part of that. Learning about the White Ferns and their kind of mediocre world cup performances can they right rectify that like it's all really interesting kiwi sports stuff it's not like just uh this is happening that's happening it's like real interesting stuff that invigorates the aotearoa sporting senses football fans preparing for a home Ooh. world cup as well there's they should have a squad come for their games against i think it's portugal and argentina they should have a squad this week i think um Charlie Sledger Walker continuing to break records mm. and win awards and then college, uh, the women's college basketball in the States. You know, we could, we could go on for a while here if we wanted to. We did do a deep dive into the Black Caps test cricket previewing the, uh, the first test against England in general, anything to do with the Black Caps test team. We had a yarn about it in our Patreon podcast, pick up the Patreon whanau supporting the niche cache and all our content, patreon.com forward slash El Niche Cash, EL Niche Cash. Great way to support the Niche Cash straight up the guts. And we always deliver an extra podcast there every week, usually driven by ideas, questions, and queries from our Patreon Fano. You can also support the Niche Cash via Buy Me a Coffee, buymeacoffee.com forward slash the Niche Cash. 
And you can also sign up to our email newsletter that we send out every Monday and Friday evening via Substack, which has all our regular beats covered extensively. The Monday email newsletter featured some Warriors SG ball ideas, which is basically like the Warriors had an under 20s dynasty. And then at SG ball in 2020, they were third and they looked pretty good at SG ball again. But don't trip about like this SG ball moment because like the Warriors have also had an under 20s dynasty and it's kind of the same thing. Um, also, lots of Super Smash notes in that email newsletter. The wildcard broke down uh, the whole Sean Marks trading Kyrie as well as Kiwis in the NBL. So check that out via Substack. The nichecase.substack.com. That goes out every Monday and Friday evening straight to your direct to your email with lots of Aotearoa sporting information. Pick up the website, the niche-case.com. Let us enter the mindfulness portal. Yeah, the mindfulness portal. Um, so I've gone with another alternative source for these ones rather than just Googling mindfulness Zen quotes or chucking in a philosopher into Google or whatever and uh, or checking a couple of the old apps that have always come in handy. This one is for, actually, I picked it out from a, a movie I was watching last night because I like to chuck on a film at night and unwind and enjoy some uh, artistic expression that way and i watched um chungking express which is a hong kong film from 1990 something it was from from the 90s directed by wong kar wai um very i guess famous i don't know i don't like to say world cinema because that sounds real dismissive where it's like and if anything isn't made in hollywood it must be world cinema it's like well this stuff's probably better in general anyway, but um, I digress. The opening quote, opening line from um, Chungking Express is the dude talking in a, a sort of voiceover and he says something along the lines of, because it's translated, obviously, so it's a little bit of a subtitly thing, but um, he says, you brush past so many people every day, some you may never know anything about, others might become your friend someday. It's a relatively simple way of describing an interesting idea that, I, that sort of made me think there about like, how often do you just walk past a stranger and you either give them no thought or maybe you give them a passing thought or whatever or maybe you even have a little conversation or whatever it's like you you don't actually know anything about this person maybe you will someday maybe you won't that alone is already a weird idea with even the idea of if you never will it's still an interesting thing to just be like how often people just brush past each other like ships in the night you know just throughout just throughout our daily life in general how often how many interactions we have with people where it's like it never goes beyond this thing of like i'm i don't know <laughs> talking to someone on the cu customer service line or something like that there's a strict parameter to that um to that uh interaction or just you know the the person giving you your coffee at the cafe or whatever or any kind of situation like this um person standing in front of you in the line at the warehouse <laughs> you know it's it's, a, it's an interesting idea about how much like um how much we do but also especially how much we don't know about just the random people we interact with throughout our day makes it even more important to have empathy for them because if you're probably exactly no idea what they're going through no idea how they got to where they are right now so deploy a bit of empathy for them and their journey and wish them well on their uh future endeavors on their mission let's get into some aotearoa sport here <laughs> the headline banger section the marquee home of mediocre chili takes you can have a go at this one, mate. Don't mind if I do. Uh, old mate Sean Marks, as teased at the start, been up to activities lately. He's, um, I guess you could say he's put out another fire in Brooklyn. He's traded away Kyrie Irving. Uh, he got to a point where I think it was like, I mean, because they could have extended him in the offseason. They didn't do that. Kyrie opted into the last year of his contract. He seemed to still, for some reason, up to this point, think he was going to get like superstar level money for his next deal brooklyn had no intention by the seams of it of ever giving him that so 
when he realized he wasn't going to get it before the trade deadline, he said, well, trade me then, even though actually when he and Durant were both healthy at once and Jacques Vaughn had taken over as coach, Brooklyn were actually looking like a team that could contend for a championship. Um, kind of blew that one up there, but I think probably Brooklyn Nets, one way or another, Sean Marks probably relatively happy to be free of the bloke as it happens. Um, Marks's reputation has taken a little bit of a hit lately. I would suggest um, for... I, I guess it's stuff he brought on himself. Like he willingly chose to bring in some of the most, a couple of the most volatile personalities, one in particular in the NBA to his basketball team, assuming they could make that work in flashes. It did on the overall, it didn't um, just trade requests all over the show. You know, he signed Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving traded for James Harden. He traded away James Harden. He didn't trade Kevin Durant when he wanted to be traded, but he did trade Kyrie Irving when he asked for it. It's just chaos on top of chaos. And this whole situation in a weird way reminded me of something I'd noticed looking at a Stephen Adams stat. With Stephen Adams stat being the fact that he is currently fourth in the NBA in overall rebounds per game. He was a little bit higher in his big rebounds, rebounding uh, surge recently, but he hasn't been playing for a, cup for a week or two. So he's, he's dipped slightly. You look at the top 10 in rebounds. DeMontis Sabonis, Giannis Antetokounmpo, uh, Rudy Gobert, Stephen Adams, Clint Capelli, uh, Nikola Jokic, Nikola Vucevic, uh, old mate um, Randall from the, from the Knicks. You got Avika Zubac, you got DeAndre Ayton. Julius Randle is the only man in the top 10 for rebounds who's actually from the USA and the USA's National Basketball Association competition. You got a Lithuanian, a Greek, a Frenchman, a dude from Aotearoa. You got a Switzerland uh, national. You got Serbian, a Montenegrin. You got a Croatian. You got Aiton from the Bahamas, which I didn't actually realize. I thought, I assumed he was American, but he's actually from the Bahamas and moved there, I think, in high school to go to. Um, to play for a progressive basketball career, basically. One American in the top 10. Used to be the days when it was like Andre Drummond, DeAndre Jordan, Dwight Howard, Demarcus Cousins, Blake Griffin, dudes like this at the top every year, all these American fellas. Not anymore. These days, Americans can't rebound. Uh, only the international dudes are the elite rebounders. And it seems like Americans also don't know how to stick with one team through adversity because there is like an idea about how the modern NBA, the superstar player is always agitated, always like the player power empowerment type thing. The, you're only ever one bad move away from your best player requesting a trade. And then what do you got? To, you got to trade him at that point because you don't want to tank the entire team's chemistry. Nikola Jokic has had some tough times at the Denver Nuggets. Like some of it's been through injuries to guys around him, but they haven't quite had a, you know, he hasn't won a championship with or anything like that, but he's stuck through with Denver throughout the whole thing. Won a couple MVPs with them. Giannis Antetokounmpo was supposedly close to... Everyone thought he was going to ask to be traded, get out of the Milwaukee system. That wasn't working. It was... you know They couldn't find a coach that was going to do it. Instead, what he did was he re-signed on a big deal and then led them to a championship and also won a couple of MVPs. Uh, Joel Embiid is still in Philadelphia. Everyone else has left Philadelphia from the process days except Joel Embiid. He's still there, the Cameroonian. He's hanging in there. Um tempted to chuck in Luka Doncic at the um, Dallas Mavericks. I think it's probably the next guy ready to enter this kind of realm. Supposedly, we're in an era with star players constantly on the brink of requesting trades, but the star players who have actually been traded in recent years are all the American ones. You know, Anthony Davis and um, uh, James Harden. Harden's been traded multiple times. He's been traded about three times in his career once. And the trade affectionately known as the Stephen Adams trade way back when. Um, Russell Westbrook, Chris Paul, Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, uh, DeMarcus Cousins. I guess you could count him when he went to um, New Orleans. Uh, Jimmy Butler a couple of times. Kyrie Irving, uh, Donovan Mitchell might even stretch back far enough to include a bit of Kevin Love in this one. All American dudes. And you might as well even put, it's not a trade thing, but you might, the free agency shenanigans of guys like LeBron James and Kevin Durant, you might as well put those in the same thing. There was one international dude who I think sort of bucks the trend, which is Rudy Gobert. He's the one sort of major international star who's had a big trade recently. Kind of more a team decision. Um, admittedly, so with some of the other ones with those American dudes, but still. Um, do want to hype up Damian Lillard? Still with the Portland Trailblazers, the one guy who's really bucking the trend there. But the wider trend itself is still pretty clear. And I mean, I can throw up some theories as to why that might be. 
comfort zones, cultural district, cultural differences, American ingrained consumer, selfish identity, individualism type uh, mentality. Doesn't really matter. What matters is that the last four MVPs have gone to overseas players. Like that's the era that we're in. The next one is likely to go to an overseas player again, whether it's Giannis or Jokic or um, Doncic. They seem like the three guys at the top of the queue. Clearly, what Sean Marks has needed is fewer of these American egos on his team and a few more international heroes. And he was recently hanging out at a Breakers game. So, you know, within a week of that, he's gone and traded away Kyrie Irving. I wonder if he might have just picked up a few ideas there about how to actually build a competitive team. Pesky old uh, egocentric Americans. I'm here to yeah. dish out some Super Smash MVP awards. Got elimination finals coming up on Thursday. Men's Super Smash MVP award goes to Otago's Dean Foxcroft. Otago finished second in the Super Smash, and they're going to play in Northern Districts. They're hosting that game in Dunedin. Dean Foxcroft is first for Super Smash runs. 48 average, strike rate of 125, 350s, really impressive. Andy was also reasonably good with the ball. Nine wickets at an average of 20.11. So he was a top 12, top 15 bowler. And he was also first for runs. And of course, Dean Foxcroft is third. He has the third highest T20 batting average ever. Shout out to Chris Harris. He's still first. He's never getting beaten there. And of course, we got Devin Conway. He is seventh. Devin Conway averages 43.44. Dean Foxcroft averages a nice holistic 44. Third highest T20 batting average ever. First in Super Smash runs. Really good with the ball. Great fielder for Otago. That is the men's MVP, women's MVP. It's got to be Lee Kasprick. She is second for wickets. She's got 14 wickets and an average of 12.28, RPO of 5.93. Lower average than Gabby Sullivan and Missy Banks, who are the only bowlers with the uh, same amount of wickets. Lee Kasprick took as many wickets and 10 fewer overs than both of them. And she was pretty decent with the bat this season as well. She has 85 runs and an average of 28.33, strike rate of 110. So another fantastic all-round performer in the Women's Super Smash. Best player on the best team, Lee Kasprick, Women's MVP. What is your stat for this week? Steadies this week is all about the breakers and the fact that they were terrible last season. And they were really good this season. And there's, you know, but it's not going to speculate on all the reasons why that is, but there are some obvious ones about I mean, the pandemic is one thing, but it's not just that. The pandemic and the fact they played away from home, like the Phoenix weren't as bad as the Breakers were with that situation. Um, I think a lot of that made bad habits worse with the the, the lack of home games and stuff. Like, obviously, it's a thing. Um Anyway, I don't want to go too deep on that because I've got stats to throw. Yeah, just give us your stats. <laughs> Let's do the actual numbers and stick to the stick to the script. Um, so last year, NBL two two breakers were dead last, and in doing so, they allowed eighty eight point five points um, per game to their opposition, which was the second worst in the league, ninth out of ten teams. This year, eighty point two points per game allowed. Best in the league. Gone from second worst to best in the league in opposition points allowed. Opposition field goal percentage. It's gone from 48.1%, worst in the league last year, 43.2%, second best in the league this year. Opposition three-point percentage. 39, 35.9 last year, dead last. 31.5% against them this year. Best in the league. So that's one situation right there. Opposition three-point percentage where they've gone from dead last to dead first like best in the competition in one season the turnaround is incredible um here's another one opposition assists last year they allowed 17.9 assisted baskets against them per game worst in the league 14.6 best in the league this time around their own stats now like their own like offensive stats field goal percentage 
42.2% last year. That was seventh worst. Not not quite cellar dwellers, but he's still bottom half of the table. And not quite at the top this time in terms of field goal percentage, but 46.2 was third best, which is a considerable rise. And when you're that good defensively, you don't need to also be the best offensive team. You just need to be good enough, right? Um, lesson we see quite often in sports. They've made steady improvements offensively to match the fact that they've suddenly gone from the worst defensive team to the best defensive team. And that'll get you second on the ladder. Their own three-point percentage shooting um, shooting stats. Last year, they shot 30.7, which was just ahead of, I can't remember who it was, um, Cairns or Brisbane or someone last year. So that's ninth, second worst in the league this year. 36% from three-point line, third best. Again, steady improvements. Offensive rating. They went from 104.5 points allowed per 100 positions is pretty much how that is described. Ninth wor- ninth best, so second worst, to 113.8, fifth best, right in the middle. Like Offensive rating, again, this following the same theme, where the defense has gotten incredible, offense has gotten steadily better in order to match that and that's all it takes defensive rating here's where we prove that point because this is maybe the most incredible of all of these stats the defensive rating last year was 115.9 worse than the league this year it's 10 full points and then some better 105.5 best in the league net rating therefore obviously combining those two last two stats going to be considerably better minus 11.4 net rating last year worse in the league plus 8.3 this year second best in the league And, of course, what that all combines to contribute to is wins. And last year, they only won five games. Five and 23 record. The worst the franchise has ever had in its history. Needless to say, they finished last, so that was the worst in the league as well. This year, finished second, 18 and 10 record. Um, That is the best winning percentage the Breakers have had since the 2014-15 season. And if you check out the old Wikipedia page or whatever for Breakers 2014-15, you'll find out very quickly that that was the last season the Breakers won a championship. So this is the best they've been in terms of just pure win-loss record since their last championship season. Having ha- coming off their worst ever season last year, it's like absolutely incredible how quickly they've turned things around and how drastically. Kyle Jamison has been included in the Black Caps test squad to face England. And my stats this week revolve around Kyle Jamison's test career. He's played three years of test cricket, 2020, 2021, 2022. Here are his bowling averages over each of those three years. 14.44, 17.51, 28.35. So they are slowly and steadily increasing which for bowling averages, I'm not going to say means he's getting worse. I think it's just more he's mellowing out after a very crazy start to his test career. And it's also aligned with his economy rates. Also increasing with each year, 2.26, 2.51, 3.16. So this is the first year of Kyle Jamison's test career in which he's averaging over 20 and conceding more than three runs per over. Sorry, last year was that. First test coming up. First test of the year. We'll see how Kyle Jamison tracks this year with his unique bowling style. Deep in the mangroves, what do you got? Yeah, how's this for a a busy January transfer window around the world? Um, wasn't actually January transfer window in all of these places that I'm gonna gonna list, but they were January transfers involving Kiwi footballers. Um, and we're gonna go like ten through to one. I'm gonna count them down just to, in terms of how how excited I am about them slash how sort of impactful I think they are as as moves within these players' careers. Number ten, Stefan Marinovic. He was playing for Hapoel Tel Aviv in Israel, and now he's not. He hasn't actually gone anywhere else yet. Um, Hopefully there's something lined up, but he's currently a free agent because the team was conceding too many goals. So they signed a new goalie and released Marinovic. That's what's happened to him. Um, That's why he's last on this list. (laughs) Number nine, 
Ellie Green, she was playing for Valeringa in Norway, who were the best team in Norway last year, but she wasn't really playing for them. She was sitting on the bench watching and hardly getting a minute. So she's moved to AGF in Denmark, which is a stronger league, but for a weaker team. But it should mean that she plays a lot more. And with her place in the uh, World Cup squad in six months, probably very much in doubt, I would suggest at this point, she's really got to do something above and beyond to get back in there. Uh, Pretty good move for her. Eight, Andre de Jean was playing quite nicely at the start of the season for Royal AM in South Africa and then just fell out steadily over the course of the next few months, just fell out of the rotation to where he, I don't think he'd played a game since about November. There was a World Cup break in there, but still he wasn't, just wasn't really featuring for them. So he's gone to Stellenbosch, same league, um, but a team that's a few steps down the ladder, which again, like a, a weaker team for more playing time, seems like a smart decision and guess what he played his first game on the weekend he started got over an hour that's what we want to see from him number what am i up to seven this is a two for indy riley and hannah blake who have both been mid-season additions to a-league teams hannah blake tried to get into the nwsl after finishing a college thing but americans not only do they not know how to rebound not only can they not stick with an nba team through tough times they also don't know how to scout kiwi footballers because every year there's at least one international who is involved in either the mls or the nwsl draft and they never get picked um just doesn't happen so hannah blake signed with perth Came off the bench and scored on debut on the weekend. So there you go. And Indy Riley also scored on debut, having gone from... She was playing in Denmark for one of the top teams in Denmark, Fortuna Huring, but they've been not at their best this year. Uh, She wasn't playing much, and when she was playing, it was out of position. So she's gone back to Brisbane. Again, World Cup in mind. Scored on debut for, for the Raw, returning to them, and continues to play pretty much every game. Six, Matty Garbett. Sitting on the bench a whole lot for Torino. He's now gone on loan to Nak Breda in the second tier of Dutch football. Again, just like get some minutes, experience, time to play lots of senior football. He's done the other stuff. He's sat on the bench enough. Exciting times for him. Five, Kyan Donkers. Signed from Kashmir Technical. He was with Kashmir Technical, New Zealand under-19 striker. Went on trial to NEC Nijmegen. Um which is where Mike Den Haye used to play back in the day. So there is a surprisingly a Kiwi connection there. And he had a trial. He is, I think he has some Dutch heritage, which is probably why Netherlands was the place to go. Had a trial, got signed. He's in their under-19s team now. That's cool. Uh, another Kiwi fella getting on the professional bandwagon. Number four, Ben Wayne, Plymouth Argyle. Don't really need to say more about that. That one's been well publicized. Everyone knows what's going on. Number three, Abby Ursig getting traded from North Carolina Carriage to racing Louisville. Bit of a surprise for her, probably a bit of a bummer for her as well, but also from someone who's been following this stuff, and let's just say North Carolina Courage has not been a very functional organization for the last couple of years, despite the fact that before that, they had a championship dynasty going on. Well, I think it's probably not the worst thing for Abby Hersek's career for a little bit of a change in scenery here to go to a more ambitious club, such as Louisville, who are a young team trying to get better, want some veteran leadership. We'll just go get the best veteran defensive leader in the competition. Why not? Number two is Chris Wood. Thought he might have been number one, not number one. I got a got a funny one coming up. Well, not a funny one. I got a, a bolter coming up. Chris Wood, Newcastle United. Having a fun old time there, but not playing much. What are you going to do? Go to a team where you're going to get more opportunities. He hung around for 53 weeks with Newcastle, during which time only two weeks were both Alexander Isak and Callum Wilson, the other two strikers in the squad, both at the squad, because Isak was signed midway through that, and also fit and available at the same time. Basically milked it absolutely perfectly. He only had one fortnight where he was ever anything less than the second string striker. And as soon as that happens... Just go on loan to Nottingham Forest. Start your first couple games. Sweet ass. And finally, number one, Marco Staminich, who isn't actually a transfer. It didn't happen in January, but they did announce at Copenhagen that he was going to be released at the end of his contract. Didn't want to sign a new one. That's because he signed on a deal to join Red Star Belgrade in Serbia, his father's homeland, at the end of the season as a free agent. They are a perennial Champions League club running away with the Serbian League right now. 
extremely good areas for Marco Stamenic. That could be huge. That could keep him in the, you know, you play Champions League this year. That could keep him in the Champions League for several more years to come, racking up those appearances at the highest level. Just what we want to see, right? Super Smash Elimination Finals. So, men's Super Smash deep in my mangroves. We've got a Thursday Elimination Final, Otago versus Northern Districts. Otago recently promoted Jake Gibson up to open, and he's just responded with two 50-plus scores. Two half bangers, strike rate of 149.7 this season, and along with Dean Foxcroft, they will be crucial batters at the top of the order. Hamish Rutherford's a veteran presence, but he's not. he doesn't have any 50s this season. Not a dominant force, but he's going to bang a few boundaries at the top. And then you've got Dean Foxcroft and Jake Gibson as in-form batters. Lou Johnson offers some middle-order hitting. Ben Lockrose has a strike rate of 192.3. He's down the order, and he is a very fine young slugger. And he's also churning out the most overs for Otago for the spinners. He's bowled 35 overs, most overs overall, in fact. So watch out for Ben Lockrose with the ball. He's not a huge wicket taker. That job goes to Michael Ray, Seamer, and Matthew Bacon. Also a Seamer. Both have been fantastic this season. But Ben Lockrose has relied upon to bowl a lot of overs a spin. You might also get a bit of Michael Rapon floating back into the Otago system for this elimination final. Because you might also get a bit of Kane Williamson floating into the elimination final for Northern Districts. I don't think you will. Might get Santner. Who knows, Bolte might even fly back for an elimination final with Northern Districts. We have to wait and see there. But the Northern Districts premise is basically Cartane Clark going berserk up top. Then you've got Jeet Raval, Joe Clark, Tim Seifert, uh, Henry Cooper offering real solid batting mahi below or and cipher it around Cartney Clark. Northern Districts have like a Super Smash Championship pedigree. They know what to do. They've done it before, and that's evident in a lot of their spinners. Joe Walker, Freddie Walker, Tim Pringle has basically replaced Ish Sodi in that T20 lineup. The Dutch international, he's been pretty good this season. Neil Wagner might even play. He's played his first Super Smash game for a couple of summers the other week, so be good to see him lacing up. I'm favoring Northern Districts just because they've done it before. They know how to win these games. And I think they're just a more well-rounded T20 team, especially if you get a bit of Santner. Probably going to get a bit of Wagner. And then, who knows? The other Jokers might pop up as well. Women's Super Smash, you've got a game between Otago and Canterbury, a repeat from the double banger we had this weekend which was split between Canterbury and Otago. Oh, Otago won both of them, sorry. So Otago carried that form into this elimination final. And they have been well served by Olivia Gain and Bella James. Bella James, strike rate of 147. Olivia Gain, strike rate of 126. They've filled the void left by Susie Bates. Kate Ibrahim's always scoring runs. Polly Inglis is really good with the bat. No Eden Carson or Susie Bates or Haley Jensen in their bowling unit, but Kate Ibrahim's really good with the ball. Emma Black is one of the best seamers in Super Smash, and you got the uh, leggy offies of Sophie Oldershaw. They're coming up against the Canterbury team, led by Kate Anderson and Amy Satterthwaite. Kate Anderson is the only batter across both Super Smash tournaments with over 400 runs. She's got more runs than Amy Satterthwaite. She's doing all right. If Canterbury can find some runs from other batters, they'll be real useful as well, especially in an elimination final. Um, they will need other batters to stand up, someone like Nat Cox, maybe Fran Wilson, maybe Izzy Sharp pops back from the Under-19 World Cup. We'll have to wait and see. Bowling, Canterbury has two of the best seamers in Aotearoa, Gabby Sullivan and Missy Banks. You also get a lot of quality spinovers from Amy Satterthwaite and the leggy Sarah Asmussen. I might go with Canterbury in the women's elimination final. Even though Otago defeated them twice over the weekend, 
I think Canterbury, again, just a more well-rounded team. But they will need some runs from the rest of their batting unit. Canterbury and Northern to win their Super Smash Elimination Finals. Question time. Your question. My question is regarding this upcoming Black Caps versus England Test Series. I'm going to put the over or under at 9.5. And the question is, do the total number of spin wickets across both tests for both teams combined exceed or fall under that 9.5 buffer? I'm going over 9.5. I reckon there'll be 12 to 13, maybe 15 wickets to spin in this test series. But definitely over. Definitely taking the over there. My question to you. The Breakers. It's all aboard the Breakers bandwagon time right now. But I want to know what type of bandwagon this is for the Breakers. I've got three types of bandwagons on the bandwagon scale. The Happy to Be Here bandwagon. Speaks for itself. Happy to be here. Made the finals. Who knows what will happen. And then you've got the Black Caps bandwagon. Black Caps, they, they consistently make the semi-finals and even finals of World Cups. Really good, solid, consistent performances. That's the Black Caps bandwagon. And then you've got the championship bandwagon, which is that you're there to win the championship. You've got a really good chance of winning the championship. Which bandwagon is the Breakers bandwagon? It's definitely not the first one. I think when you've been leading up near the top of the table the whole season, you're not just happy to be there. You want to win some games. Um, the Wellington Phoenix are definitely in the Black Caps bandwagon where they're not happy to make finals. They want to start winning some, but they don't necessarily expect to win a championship. I think the Breakers are above that, though. I'm not necessarily going to say they're in the championship bandwagon, but I think they'll expect to... Because I think Sydney Kings are, are definitely a better team than the Breakers, but I think the Breakers are the second best team. So they're somewhere in between Black Caps and Championship. So I don't know, Black Caps, Black, Black Caps, Caps 2019 bandwagon. heading in, heading into a Super Over. That's the Black Caps bandwagon, but at the point where there's a Super Over coming up, they're at that stage because they could win a championship. You know, they beat Sydney Kings away not that long ago. It could happen. They're just not going to be favoured. You can win a championship on the Happy to Be Here bandwagon as well. You know, that's, like that's true. It's that's possible. absolutely true. Musical Jam. Just want to big up a. Uh, song from jana and spider town baby birds and the eagles you can check that on youtube funky little video birds and the eagles any musical acts out there just make your name as easy to read as possible so it's recognizable <laughs> to everyone like just a piece of advice there but shout out jana and the and the song birds and the eagles your musical jam for this week um, did like the new single from Vera Allen, who's got a new album coming out soon. Um, her last album was, I think, in my top 10 two years ago. Um, Kiwi songwriter there who does some very excellent things, but also like on that same scale, but even more so, the new Unknown Mortal Orchestra single is fantastic. And I cannot wait for that album when that comes out soonish, a couple of months. I think both of them are coming out in a couple months. Back up yourself. Love yourself. Stay tuned for more Niche Cage content. We'll be back. Don't worry about that. Kia kaha. Stay beautiful. Achoo, achoo.